You know, I love those places where people come for important moments. Therefore, you know, I was often thinking, would I have done a movie about a, a drama, a supermarket on fire? No. No. No, but Notre Dame, yes. Anticipation, feu Notre-Dame. Notre-Dame brûle. Ça va les partir de partout. Les officiels, les politiques, les célébrités. On va avoir deux feux à gérer. Il va falloir vous battre à quelques-uns. Paris est bloqué. Feu de toiture Poursuivons reconnaissance Poursuivons reconnaissance, c'est pas bon. Ça va Alors on y va Ça veut dire désastre annoncé. Franske Jean-Jacques Arnaud er ikke bare en af Frankrigs, men en af Europas største filmager. I 1976 kickstartede han sin gloværdige karriere i hjemlandet med krigsfilmen Sorte og Hvide i Farver, som vandt Oscar'en for bedste udenlandske film. Vive la France! Vive la France! Vive la France! Arnauds næste film, Kampen om Ilden, blev også en Oscar-vinder, før han i 1986 lavede sit hovedværk, det spændingsfyldte religionsdrama Rosens Navn med Sean Connery. A man of reason in a world of blind faith. Yeah, small blood here. You mean that he committed suicide? Elementary. Og blandt instruktørens andre historiske storfilm finder vi det erotiske og romantiske drama Elskeren. Krigsfilmen Enemy at the Gates, som faktisk er en af filmhistoriens dyreste europæiske produktioner, og så også den autentiske syv år i Tibet med en ung Brad Pitt. You have to leave Tibet, Quentin. Your life is a great risk. I have made arrangements to get you out. How can I help people if I run away from them? Desuden har Anno altid haft en kæmpe forkærlighed for dyrenes rige. Særligt bjørnen fra 1988 er et mesterværk, en fantastisk hyldes til naturens verden, som krævede hele seks års forarbejde, før kameraerne rullede. Og nu er Anno biograf aktuel med endnu en bjergtagende filmoplevelse, Notre Dame i flammer. En gribende og uhyre troværdig rekonstruktion af den tragiske brand i den ikoniske domkirke den 15. april 2019. Filmen stiller især skarpt på de modige brandfolk, der satte livet på spil for at redde den historiske bygning. Og vi har talt med den sympatiske og snaksalige Anno, som for nylig slog smut forbi København. Well, Sean Chuck, it's a pleasure to meet you. I've been a fan of your work for so many, many years, so it's a pleasure to have you here in Copenhagen and talk to you about your latest, very beautiful, very powerful, very gripping and, and emotional film. I couldn't help but wonder because I know that you grew up in a household with parents that were very passionately atheists, and you've right. talked to yourself about being, sure. being that as well, but also very fascinated about religion, about spirituality, sure. and in watching this film, I couldn't help but get the feeling that this has been made by someone who loves Notre Dame. And I know you've been very passionate about churches in specific, uh, specifically right, as correct. well. Yes. But when when did your love affair with Notre Dame specifically begin? But, you know, it's, it's quite simple as a matter of fact. I, I, I was a boy living in the, in the suburb, not far from Paris, about 10 kilometers. Uh, but we'd take the train once a week and go to Paris. And the railway station was called Paris Pont Saint Michel. When you were going up the stairs, the first thing you'd see is Notre Dame. And my mother loved uh, heritage uh, monuments. So very often we'd go around, sometimes we'd go inside because my mother would have a candle. Once again, not a believer, but You know, she liked to pray for a, uh, an uncle that was not well, <laughs> things like that. And I was so impressed because I, I'm talking when I was really tiny, you know, when I was four years old. And then when I was offered my first camera, uh, my steel camera, of course, uh, as my mother offered it to me, first picture was my mother. But the second picture was Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> And then I went all the way up to the gallery, La Galerie des Chimères, where you have all those monsters you know, like this. And I was fascinated. And I think that had a big influence. Well, uh, while I, I was uh, learning cinema in the film schools in, in, in Paris, I, uh, I took uh, lessons still at the Sorbonne 
And two of my uh, topics were history of the medieval art and history of the Middle Ages. And I live now, for the last 40 years, I've been living mostly abroad. But when I'm in Paris, I have a lovely apartment, five minutes walk from Notre Dame that I can see from my balcony. So, so you know, it, it has a special resonance for me. And what you were saying, it's bizarre because I am absolutely uh, not a believer. I don't, I, but I respect religions. Yeah. The re and I respect faith that I don't have. And I am always impressed with those places, whatever religion it is. You know, I did uh, several years ago a movie called Seven Years in Tibet. Mm. It was so fascinating to go from monastery to monastery in Tibet or Ladakh, being among those monks with a prayer mill. Um, ne, pot, ne, um, 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 um. I had a shiver, you know. And the same thing if I go to a mosque. I remember the emotion I had in Jenny, in northern Mali. There is the largest, highest construction in Earth. It's fascinating. And, you know, I love those places where people come for important moments. Therefore, you know, I was often thinking, would I have done a movie about a, a drama, a supermarket on fire? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. But Notre Dame, yes. Yeah. Because it, because of the symbol it is as well, you know. But but like you say, like you say, it's a symbol. But I I guess it's especially for 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 the French, of course. It's it's something especially significant. And I wonder, do you feel like, of course, you're here with us now in Copenhagen. We love having you here. But do you feel like, can I, as a Dane, appreciate sort of the power of Notre Dame and also the pain of its destruction in the same yes, way that, yes, you, that yes. you can? You, you know what? The French they don't go to church anymore. Mm. Uh, only 10%, I think, of the population. Uh, but Notre Dame is the symbol of Paris, of course, symbol of France, for sure, but it's far beyond that. That day or the day after, I had spent four years in China. I had so many friends from China who were crying. Uh, I was a friend of the fr French ambassador in, the, in Russia, And she, when she came to the embassy the next morning, there was a chapel being built overnight and people praying in front of the French flag. Mm. So, so, you know, it, it was, it's far above that. It's a, and, and since this drama that we experience uh, uh, on the east of Europe, uh, a lot of people see uh, something similar. People would not believe that a symbol of Western civilization could collapse. Nobody could believe that it would happen because it was impossible. This cathedral has been here for nine centuries. And this is the most visited sacred monument in the world. Mm. Paris is the number one destination in the world for tourists. Mm. Not everybody goes to Eiffel Tower, but Notre Dame, yes, because it's the center of a very historical part of Paris and it's free. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and like you say, it's been there for for 900 years, and the movie is primarily, I feel, a very gripping, authentic reconstruction of the event. But in between that, it also feels very much like an indictment of modern technology, of modern infrastructure, of modern bureaucracy. All these things tangling together, preventing us from saving this historic monument. So, in very many ways, it's it's sort of a huge conflict between the old and the new in a way. Right. And, and you know, one of the problem was that, and still is in Paris, we have the Olympic Games in uh, two years time now. And they were in those days, like today, 5,000 roadworks inside Paris. 5,000. Wow. I live nearby. If you take a car, it, it takes you sometimes three quarters of an hour. Wow. Well, it should take you five minutes, you know. Yeah. So, so th it shows that um, and nobody, that's the curiosity, nobody thought about it. To the point that the, the, the fire truck couldn't go on the cycling, because it's new in, in Paris, you know, they want to do like Copenhagen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but unfortunately, they have very little room for cars. And in those days, there was no, no, no one on the bicycle lane. But the problem, each red light, you had like a funnel. Nobody thought that the uh, fire trucks couldn't go through. Mm. Neither the ambulances, so they had to redo it. But w when, when it happened, they were stuck. Mm. So, so, you know, the accumulation of, of tiny mistakes 
And especially I insist on that. People could not believe, you know, what happened is no one called the fire, the fire brigade. Mm. Because, well, I mean, here, if you had a massive fire in an historical monument, I don't think you would yourself call the firemen because you'd think everybody would know. It's a, you have a gigantic plume of smoke. Yeah. It, it, uh, but this is what happened. Nobody yeah. called for half an hour. Yeah, that's incredible. You, you, you see people walking by and there's the smoke. And yeah, they take just, pictures, yeah. Yeah. they call their friends, yeah. but not the, police, not the police and not not the fire brigade. But do you then hope that, that a movie like this can impact sort of the conversation about this sort of stuff? Also, of course, there's a lot of things you can take with you from, from this film. Also, of course, how it's honoring this epic endeavor to, to stop the fire, but also for hopefully to make us aware of our shortcomings in, in sure. our infrastructure, sure. our technology, all this sort of stuff. But, but you see, this fire and the movie now has a huge impact. Um, you know, I, I went to um, Italy, Spain, Portugal, places where they have a lot of heritage uh, monuments. Since they've seen this and understood what happened, uh, they're all revising their procedures. Mm. And, and especially, you know, when I t toured France, uh, we have one, uh, 100 cathedral. Uh, all the cathedrals are revising their system. Uh, and therefore, you know, there is always something positive in negatives. But Shen Shak, you mentioned the monsters before, of course, the beautiful monsters in, in Notre Dame. And there's so many beautiful sequences in, in this film. And especially like the fire, uh, touring with the gargoyles almost and and the fire almost has this you know speaking of religion it almost has this divine power it's this sure. natural power that's beyond our control but i was wondering this beautiful destruction this beautiful chaos is that a tightrope to walk as a director not making it almost too beautiful too visually delicious you know not veering too much away from the tragicness of it all i mean i think you walked the tightrope perfectly but was that a challenge uh, i don't think so because uh you know i've done quite a number of fires in my <laughs> movies you know on name of the rose i also burnt my monastery yeah master master how do we get out with some difficulty the film before was a quest for fire, uh, so, so you know I'm sort of used to to fires. But I can tell you, it's the perfect villain, the fire, because it's charismatic. You know, if you have a villain that looks like a villain and acts like a villain, you don't like him. You you don't you're not interested in the character. But fire, that the fire brigade in Paris called Belzebuth, which is the name of a devil, Lucifer. You know, because for them it's a enemy that is living, it's moving, it's beautiful, it is photogenic, and you don't have to add anything. Not only it's photogenic, but it's roaring. <laughs> Incredible. So, you know, I know by experience is when I set my cameras, of course, there's no fire in my set, but when I ask to turn it on, it's a different image because it's inhabited by a demon. Mm. And I insist, very, very photogenic. Mm. So, you know, the, the structure of the movie is very much like a, a, a saint, a, a, a beautiful lady. It's called Lady of Paris, Notre Dame, you know, Lady of Paris. It's the most famous actress we ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and she's been respected for 865 years or something yeah. like that. Uh, so, so you have the structure of a, a, a star and a demon, and the star is dying, and the good doctors cannot come. So you, you have a perfect structure. And you don't have to push it. It's there, you know. Yeah. With, uh, I remember the firemen themselves, and they would say, you know, we often go to the opera house because for security. And Notre Dame, we're afraid to say that it was tragic, but beautiful like an opera. Mm. So, so, so it's why, you know, I, I didn't have to push anything. I just had to recreate the same density of flames. Mm. And we're talking, you know, flames that my, my actors were uh, closer to than you are to me. Uh, not in intellectually, of course, <laughs> <laughs> but um, they were a meter and a half from flames that were above 850 degrees yeah. with the roaring. And so, so I, it was easy for me to direct yeah. because when you have such a good enemy, 
uh, you don't have to pretend it's thought. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> 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 it pretends that you're in danger. Yeah. They are in danger, yeah. and, and therefore they, they can put their acting quality uh, without thinking of uh, uh, pr pretending to to be uh, to be hot, pretending to be scared. Even those professional know the, the fire. You know the danger is the fire is so attractive. Uh, the firemen they call that the mosquito syndrome. Okay. Because it's so fascinating that you're attracted by something that may kill you. Yeah. The uh, officers, they have to tell the young recruits, don't go to, stop, come back, it's dangerous. Because you have that. So, so those elements uh, were made my life easy, although, you know, when you do things like that, it's very dangerous. Mm. Uh, and uh, my I was not preoccupied by the quality of images and all that, quality of acting. I was just worried that something may go wrong. Fortunately, it was a, a seamless uh, yeah, uh, yeah. shoot. But I love this idea of Notre Dame being an amazing actress. So I'm looking forward to it being the first uh, building to win the César for, uh, for, best, uh, for best actress, of course. Uh, that would be, a, that would you, be a, you know, uh, one thing that I suddenly, a few weeks ago, I thought of an episode, uh, when I did The Name of the Rose, I became a very close friend to Umberto Eco. Yeah. And one day, I was doing promotion for a movie called The Bear that I had uh, directed. I love it, uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I remember rushing to the Sorbonne, the French university, because uh, Umberto got a uh, the toga and the hat and all that, you know, I was honored as a doctor uh, honoris causa. I was late, he was getting down, and he said to me, he said, ah, I read that you love little bears, but no, this is not your purpose. Your purpose is to make the world cry with the story of a stone. <laughs> and I just said, that's very strange that he said that to me, you know, <laughs> uh, because it is the story of a stone yeah. that is in danger. But that is also one of the very interesting direct questions that's asked in your film is a piece of brick worth more potentially than a human life is it worth risking flesh and blood for a building and i wanted have you yourself had those reflections is there a certain piece of art something the size of notre dame that is worth putting your life on the line to protect is is there some art that is yeah. more valuable than life perhaps well you know i I think so, and I was very moved when the, those firemen. I said to them, "I don't, under, I don't understand what, what went in your in your head. Your motto is to say, all right, I risk my life to save other lives, but now you've been risking your life to save stones. Explain to me." Mm. And they all said the same thing. They said, "What is my life compared to the stones of Notre Dame?" Mm. And. You know, that was uh, very touching. Now, your question is, uh, would I put my life uh, on risk uh, to save the Louvre? Yes, Yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you also spoke about the, the roaring sound of the fire before, and I have a huge interest in sound. My brother is a sound designer for, for movies as, as, uh, as well. And audio-wise, there's so many beautiful sequences in the film, especially like the scene where the smoke engulfs the firefighters, and you can all just hear them counting the steps. Right, right, right. And the right. sound is what creates the environment. And also with the water hitting the bell, mm -hmm. it's so beautiful in slow motion. How first you hear the dripping, and then you hear sort of the sound of the bell moving in. It's sort of like the bell the coming humming, alive the again. Yeah, it's so beautiful. What what was <laughs> your 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 sort of approach to the work of the sound design of the film? As usual, you know. For people are asking me why I'm not doing more movies. Well, each movie takes me three and a half years mm. because it's a, a year to prepare to understand the subject matter. Uh, here I interviewed all the firemen that were involved in that fire, all the neighbors, uh, all the officials, because I like to be emerged. So that's a personal pleasure, you know. I, I like being a student, and I've been studying now uh, the fireman heart. <laughs> <laughs> and to answer your question, I am known for a long pre-production time. I prepare a lot, mm. and I, I build big sets, but only the, the sets are going to be shown in the movie. I'm not, I'm not asking for 
extra uh, shots if I change my mind. No, I won't change my mind. This is the angle, you build from here to there. Uh, and, and, and then for the sound, it takes me, a, 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 it took me for this one a year. Mm. Uh, because there were very odd things to reproduce. You know, when, when, when you shoot, there is uh, the sound of all the fans. Uh, some cameras are noisy, especially the high-speed cameras, uh, although I shot digital, but there's still a humming and all that. So you have to re recreate and uh, post-synchronization, of course, uh, with all the actors. And it sounds like, for instance, I had the, problem, the following problem. How does a drop of melted lead sounds when it hits a medieval piece of oak? <laughs> you don't, Sounds you, like a riddle, and you answered it beautifully in uh, the film. Well, but it took us uh, a few weeks to make it right. Wow. And also, you know, when we have the, the scene where all the ceiling is collapsing, as we did that in a soundstage, mm. uh, we have 75 cubic meters of burning uh, timbers and uh, all kind of stuff that was falling on the chairs of the cathedral. But we used balsa wood for the shoot. Yeah. But now we have to recreate the sound. And the first sound my sound crew came with, I remember, I said, this is not oak falling on the chairs, this is pine. Yeah, <laughs> you could hear it in the oh, timber. Of course, yeah. because it goes poink instead yeah. of <laughs> <"Bow!"> <laughs> <laughs> you know? And with the, to have the power, yeah. uh, well, we had to rent a, qua a crane 40 meters high. We had to go to a place where they had old oak timbers and drop it on the ground. But it took us several days to, to, to make it proper because if you put your mic too soon, how many of brother would know that? Yeah. <laughs> but it goes clack yeah. and it doesn't go plunk, et cetera, et cetera. So we, you know, we have scenes also where the, the, the lead is melting and goes through the, a goggle. What's the sound of that? Yeah. You know, we, we, we started with uh, something that would not be dangerous like yogurt. Uh, 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 then we tried silicone, and then we ended up with real lead. Uh, huge tins of burning lead. Yeah, because we, the sound was ridiculous. Or, or, you know, lead, first, it's very heavy. So it goes very fast, it goes splack, and then it goes How do you do sp splock and <laughs> <laughs> But I love that attention to detail. I mean, and it it, 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 it does it does matter. I mean, yeah, I, I remember my brother actually he did a little bit of sound work for Dunkirk, uh, Christopher oh, right, Nolan's right, right. war movie, where sure. they also discovered that there was a certain boat that they shot, but they didn't have the sound of it. And one of the only remaining types of that boat was in Copenhagen. So he went out and shot that particular boat, how turning right, turning left, stopping sure. and sure. starting, it's to have that perfect piece of the tapestry. You, you know what what it does is makes the audience comfortable to believe the story. Yeah. And, and in my early days, I was heavily criticized uh, because I was pay, uh, paying too much attention to details. And I was explaining the accumulation of details that, sound right, that look right and sound right make you believe that the story also is worth listening to. Mm. And, and this is why, you, you know, I spend all that time, I am in the sound, on sound stages every single day. When we do the follies, what is the sound of banging on a medieval door in a narrow uh, staircase? Is it bang, bang, bang? Or is it bonk, bonk, bonk? Uh, but that's easy for me to direct, to say, I want punko, punko, punk. Yeah. But then you have to make it work. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Just a little detail as well. But like you, you talk about working on the sound stages and building the sets. And I know, of course, Notre Dame wasn't really open or available while you were also shooting. Can you talk to me a little bit about the approach of reconstructing the church and also sort of the combination of of those reconstructions of real footage to create this whole tapestry right. of authenticity. Well, you know, it, it's the charm. The, the more I go, the more easy I feel my <laughs> job is. Uh, <laughs> therefore, what I adore is to make, like I did in Quest for Fire, for instance, years ago, uh, shoot a white shot in uh, Glencoe in Scotland uh, with tigers and all that and then make the pickups, uh, th this angle in Canada and that angle in Kenya. And nobody sees that 
it's fake. It's movie magic. It's movie making, you know. And therefore, you know, here, what was the situation? My star was unavailable. She was in hospital. I couldn't disturb my star. Therefore, I used body doubles. What are the body doubles? Well, the cathedral that inspired Notre Dame and the cathedral and the other cathedral that was inspired by Notre Dame. First cathedral in the world, a Gothic cathedral, is in Sens, 100 kilometers south of Paris. When Paris became more important than Sens, they wanted to have the same cathedral, but bigger. Mm. But they copied, they asked the same architects. Therefore, all the high angles I shot in Sens, but the reverse, low angle, I shot in Bourges because there was five naves. In Sens, only three. Notre Dame, five. What I love is that even I, when I edit, I don't remember where I shot because it, it, it's the same actors, the same extras, the same props that we were bringing in those different places, same movement, same sound. Um, now, when I had fire or too much water, I had to rebuild. So we rebuilt exactly at the same dimension. And you know what was complicated is we couldn't use foam as uh, it's so easy to do sculpture in foam. So we had to, to make it either in plaster or copy the, 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 those monster animals uh, and carve them uh, identical in, in the same stone. It was very pleasant for all the film technicians, you know, because we were working with the specialized people. We restore all those castles in, in France, churches and cathedrals. So, so it was a very, very high level of, uh, of art, should I say. And everybody was excited, you know. That's the beauty is, I make it easy for myself. When people like the screenplay, like actors like the screenplay, like technician, the technician like the screenplay, I have very little to do. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> ah, mon père. Padre, aumônier. Regardez, on l'a trouvé. I actually wanted to ask you a bit of a philosophical question that I wondered about after watching the film. Have you yourself reflected about how your art will be preserved also for, for the rest of time in the coming time? Because we do live in an age where digital availability means that movies are preserved everywhere, but it also means that a lot of times they disappear from a lot of services. Movie disappears and, and a lot of services only want the newest and, and the, the biggest blockbusters. And a lot of art is, is not going up in flames, but in digital flames in a way. Have you reflected on how do you think your art, the art of cinema, the art of movies, classic movies will be? You know what, I feel very privileged. Uh, I remember that I knew Jean Renoir quite well. And Jean Renoir in those days, you know, he was a great French filmmaker. Uh, did some of the best French films. And I remember he was very worried because the only place you could see a, an old movie was at French Cinematheque, 200 seats, once every 30 years. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so he had a good reason to be worried. Where I feel I'm very privileged, you know, I'm, wherever I t tour with, the, with this movie, uh, People come with DVDs or even laser disc of <laughs> uh, you know my early movies. When I open uh, a catalog of the film available in hotels or in airplanes, that is uh, one of my movies, and some of them are 40 years old. So I think that I'm very privileged. I know w w for sure that what makes a movie uh, not uh, popular anymore is the style. Mm. You know, uh, some movie aged, for instance, the French Nouvelle Vague aged in a terrible way. Comme elle avait peur, je lui ai dit de se cacher derrière moi. Je suis son masque. While French classic of the 30s or the 50s are still on TV somewhere in the world every day. But, uh, but you know, I feel that like any art, a few people are interested, let's say, in Giotto, uh, because it doesn't look, you know, <laughs> they, they prefer Andy Warhol. Uh, <laughs> but he's going to disappear as well, you know. Uh, we have to be, be modest. It's uh, already such a privilege to see the, the work that you've been passionate about shown in so many countries. So I consider it's a very gr incredible privilege. But quite often, you know, I'm saying, it really happened to me, this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
You talked about how much time you use for preparations, your attention to detail, which made me think that that does, at least in Hollywood, where you've also, of course, worked, that does seem like a bygone era that that now with so much... Like, like you have made so many beautiful movies with animals, of, of course, where you have to train them for so long and use them, and now they're just... There's so many artificial computer-generated animals. Know, they don't want to spend the time with that. They don't want to use thousands of extras like you did in Enemy at the Gates. Do you feel like like Hollywood isn't isn't interesting for you anymore? Uh, yeah, uh, no, 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 no. I have a very, very privileged position. Uh, you know, I'm a Final Cut director already. I don't know how many we we are left <laughs> with that privilege. And when people are interested in, uh, in me directing, uh, they know that I am, I have my own style uh, and, you know, they, they tend to understand that it's better for them not to intervene too much. And of course, I, I, I love being cr criticized. It's important, you know. I love a, a producer that would say, ah, that scene is not very good. It's fine with me, you know. What I don't like is a committee of students that were, uh, they didn't get their diploma and uh, give advices to Coppola. Uh, and they know nothing. They ne never directed a movie. They have no idea how an audience reacts. But uh, they've been kicked out of the film school and therefore now they're powerful executives. Mm. Uh, so that's not for me. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm saying it right away, you know. So, <laughs> so, uh, no, I, you know, I, I think the, the big danger for foreign directors uh, to be uh, attracted with Hollywood, if you go there under their condition, you're dead. Mm. Because what the studio want is a chef uh, with uh, Michelin film star, uh, stars, but to, to do hamburgers. Yeah. Because it's a hamburger by so and so. And then, and then you, you, you start feeling that you're a piece of shit yourself. I've seen so many of my talented colleagues uh, so impressed to be called by, by Hollywood. But to make what? A bad screenplay with uh, B actors uh, under the uh, constraint of uh, uh, lawyers? Mm. Uh, very fortunately, I've, I've escaped that and I still have a wonderful relationship with, uh, with Los Angeles. Perfect. So, Jack, thank you so much for your time. It's been a huge pleasure. Uh, it was. Looking forward to what you do again and really looking forward to seeing and hearing this in the cinema again because uh, a beautiful film, both in terms of the visuals and, uh, and the thank sound. You. So, <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Merci. Merci. We asked for supplementary and There will be no support. Is the sound still okay? And You're talking so yeah. loud. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I did warn you that I am, yeah. a, I am a loud talker. <laughs> this is very good. Your voice is terrific. Oh, that's good. It, it comes yeah. through uh, clearly. Yeah. 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 Oh, that is good. Unfortunately, I, I, I would have loved to be able to do this in French, but... No, uh, no, no. 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 So, it's, yeah. it's better in English. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, let me just see. My volume is this. I'm probably talking like this. I'm very enthusiastic when I talk, so every time, every time I'm on the radio, whenever I start speaking, the first thing that happens is the producer does this <laughs> on the mixer every single time. It's like I even warn them beforehand and they still have to yeah. turn me down. They should just have a specific button yeah. for me, uh, yeah, just above mute, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, that's me. <laughs>